flight cleared for takeoff runway 10 left south departure approved. Cleared for takeoff runway 10 left United 19 or 45. Right. Welcome to another video. Yeah, we'll keep all this out. It might be a little while at times. Alright, so what I wanted to do here, um, this just came out like this week. This is the, the Bombardier CRJ uh, planes came out. They have the CRJ, this is the 550, and I think they have the 750ER. Oh, so this is 550ER and the 750ER. Um, I picked this one because um, it's kind of weird. There's a couple of libraries that come with it, at least with mine. One is with uh, Lufthansa, the other one's United Express. Uh, what I'm doing is going to do a, a flight from Chicago to um, St. Louis. So that's kind of basically, like, they basically it's a United Express route. It's not the United Airlines route. I'll explain that a little bit. Um, so this seemed to be make the most sense. I would kind of like, quote, a realistic-ish approach, you know, which I you know, really like doing. Um, oh, hold on one second, actually. I forgot. I need to turn this off. Uh, hold on. I forgot. I've been missing around a lot of stuff uh, off camera, so I just need to. I like that one on. Okay, that's good. Yeah. All right. Anyway, I'll get out of these uh, screens here in a second. Uh, I'm just kind of doing it. so. Anyway, so the goal of this video, I want to kind of go over how this plane flies, or especially as a kind of a, um, I want to say super comprehensive review, but just kind of like a broad view, just like what to expect if you purchase this. The these planes are, are it's a fifty dollar add on. However, this has been one that a lot of people have been waiting for because um, um, I think in general, all right, two things. I think you know the the type of flyers when you take the propeller planes, the small ones are definitely the ones you want to get close and look stuff. But I think for a lot of people, they also kind of like these little more, let's say, short to long. You know, let's say short to mid haul flights. You know, for a couple hours, where you kind of fly over. Um, you know, like, you know, let's say, you know, like a few hundred miles of land, you just, you know, you see quite a bit that way as well. I've really grown to like more of that recently. Um, uh, yeah, especially cause you can just put on autopilot once you get up in the air. And plus I just love the sound of commercial aviation, especially these, these jets. Like, um, like I just love this noise. Like it just sounds so cool to me and so forth. Plus I think it's a beautiful looking plane and so forth. Um, but the big thing I, I'm going to do besides that, I'm also going to go a little bit of the history of Bombardier because it's kind of interesting and a little weird as well. Uh, because long, long story short, these planes are now basically discontinued. And there's a reason for that, um, even though they've been very successful and honestly a staple of a lot of major fleets. I mean, not just you know a couple of airlines. You look at United, American, uh, Delta, I believe, have all CRJs. Um, a lot of the European airlines, like Lutons, has got the CRJ. Um, but that is kind of changing. Um, and again, I'll go more in detail uh, how that is. And hopefully, that might be. And what I'm going to be discussing about that may also might be included in this game down the road. But anyway, let's let's take off. So the one thing I will say that's a little weird uh, before I start. The speed almost kind of locks in these two positions. See, it's like like once you get up to a certain speed, you can't like go below until you almost turn it off and then gradually go back up so yeah no, it's a little weird but i'll show you when we take off this plane takes off really fast by the way so turn off the parking brake let me use a controller just make it easier take flaps it does have voices and all that First person, and we'll uh, switch it to third um, once we take off from here. I do kind of struggle with this plane, honestly, so far, um, but I've only flown it twice. Um, I see, look at this. See how it's been level 7 there? I can't lower it, and then look at this. It's top 6. Sorry, I can't raise it, and I can't lower it. United 190. Four flights here. 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 You see, it is climbing really quick. Frequency change. Oh, we're going south.
So this route's usually about, I mean, in the air, you're only in the air for about 45 to 50 minutes, roughly. Um, but it's a little over an hour, and you include taxi and all that. Um, you see, it climbs really fast, too. Especially, it's, it's notably fast in the Airbus um, 220, or sorry, not 220, 320. Um, and the other thing, it's fairly fast in the Airbus 320, which I find a little hard to believe, but... Um, I'm going to take its worth if you developed this, that is the case. I think mean, it is a smaller plane, so it is wider than the commercial aviation jets. However, um, I thought the Airbus would be faster cruising speed than this. Because, I mean, even though, like, like think about it, the 777 or the 87 or the 47, they're much larger planes. And, you know, even though, like, especially new ones are two engines, they're bigger engines, like the Airbus, compared to this. And the same, and they're, and it's like, but it, therefore it can go up to higher speeds in a cruising altitude. Now, it may take a little longer to get those speeds, but you can a lot more weight than this one. But I find it a little hard to believe. But now, that's the issue you got to do with the speed, and that's kind of what we're going to be in my review. I don't know if it's like this in real life, or they, the programs are like this, so you got to do it like this. So you almost got to, like, cut the engine so it kind of goes into the fall. like 30-ish percent, just to finally slow it down, and then you kind of gradually turn it back on. But once you hit like a certain point, it's going to like lock back into these speeds again, so. Um, and you can go up and down really quick at this point, so I'm really trying to get used to that as well. Uh, but so it's been kind of fun to try this out, definitely a different, very different style from the Airbus uh, 320 so far. Plus, I honestly, um, I actually like these planes a lot because I've I've, ride, I've flown a lot in them uh, because I usually do a lot of you know, I've flown a, I'm originally from Missouri, I live in Chicago, so I've flown a lot between St. Louis, Chicago over the years. So let's say mid Missouri, like Columbia Regional Airport to Chicago, uh, just because you know it's a, it's a you know overall it's a five to seven hour drive, pretty manageable, and especially if you put maybe some of the time you waste at the airport. But when you get to like when you're like busy with work and you you need to get out like 6 p.m. at night. It's a lifesaver because otherwise I would not get to my destination like 1 or 2 a.m. While flying, I can be there by 9, 10 o'clock. So very reasonable. Um, you can see we're kind of hovering uh, southwest Chicago now. Um, I think that's I-55 here. So, you see the engine's nowhere near as loud anymore, but now I'm decreasing in the good range. Let's uh, up the speed a little bit. Yeah, see, for me, this is the toughest thing. I'm trying to get better at the cruising altitude, the first turn I'll buy, because I like to do that. Oh, anyway, back to this. So, anyway, I actually like these planes, and um, we'll go in there to show you, but they're pretty small. They're like usually this, this plane model in particular. And the economy is two seats on each side. Um, I think some of the other ones are a little smaller and more narrow, so it'd be like one seat on one side and two on the other side. Uh, in first class, they do two one, and I think I'm both of them. I know it doesn't look like it's two one, particularly. at least on United. It may vary a lot from the other airlines, like you know, like American. So we're gonna turn this on. Let's see what's gonna do. So it's going full blast. Pretty loud too, I love that. Right, let's see what it's doing. Turn this on. Alright, it's online, that's good. Now he's got it back down. Remember, he really wants to climb way up. actually the first time I've seen these guys want to go high. Normally when I fly the Airbus 220, it wants to fly too long and crash into the mountain. It just happened too often. Ah, right, see, now we're at a nice cruising altitude. You see the engines are like, I don't want to say turned off, but on a little bubble. It's kind of hovering around here. Alright. Uh, but anyway, so kind of back to this, um, let's go back in this plane a little bit in the review. 
So, you know, again, I haven't messed everything here, but it's just like the Airbus, you can mess around with all this stuff. You can touch stuff. Um, again, since I haven't messed with it, I don't know where everything is yet compared to the Airbus uh, 220. Even that, I'm not that good with it, to be honest. Um, you can tell a similar setup, but also different as well. Like, it seems a lot more of the controllers are down here instead of, like, up here. You know, I mean, sorry, there's some up here, but, you know, compared to the Airbus, you know, it's kind of more, like, done here, and there's, like, more on this dashboard around here, it seemed like, uh, just from personal recollection. Uh, very good details, you know, I mean, just everything's, like, really well detailed in here, honestly. I think it's a really cool uh, design. Uh, let's get... It's kind of hard to view, so luckily this camera works well. I'm going to go in here a bit. They actually do the cabin, but it is really cool. You see it's like 2-2. That's a lot of them are, except for the first class. The first class is usually 2-1. Oh no, they did do that. Look at that. That's wild. They actually got it right. That's really cool. Got a great controller. We've got the right library, and this is also what I want to show you. See, this is GoJet Airlines. That is, I'm glad they put that because a lot of these United. So, so a lot of these like United Express planes are actually run not by United Airlines itself, but with these partner uh, regional like Wisconsin Air, GoJet. I think GoJet is one. Um, Air Ozark. I think you see. So you have like these basically the, these regional carriers that operate American Eagle, United Express, and, and from my understanding, the setup of this is a little. It's like so they operate. So operates United Airlines fly. So you go on them. They got the United logo. They got the United uh, uniforms. Uh, their snacks. You know the branded cups, pant napkins. Um, you know the the uh, any video information guys are all United. Um, the difference is, is I don't think the workers are directly employed by United. I could be wrong there. I think they're usually employed by these, you know, like, um, you know, like, like Air Wisconsin, for example, is one of them. And I think they're the ones that are directly responsible for the employees and not United, per se. Again, it could be wrong. It's a, it's a very unique setup because it's like, you know, anything that's like, the, let's say the Airbus 320 above is all owned and operated by United, where these are kind of more like contacted out, these other companies, but to the naked eye, it looks just like a regular United flight in, in every uh, thing possible, except for who, quote, is actually running the plane. So that that's the only difference. And that's basically how it kind of works, to my understanding. Again, it's a little weird. Um, and they got different ones across the country. Um, and the one thing I will say, you never really see these guys go overseas. Like, like, I think the only international flights I've seen between these companies might be between Canada and Mexico. So, like, but if you look at the Caribbean, I don't think I'd ever see United use a United Express flight, let's say, from Houston to Guadalcanal. Or even, you know, let's say, deep into Mexico. You know, maybe, like, to Monterey or maybe Mexico City. And again, I'm just speculating because I've not been on those routes before. But, like, American Airlines to the Caribbean, I need to use regular, their, their main, mainstay, like, 737 points and not American Eagle CRJ set. Um, and this is kind of the part I want to go into the history, kind of like what these, um, I wouldn't say these planes per se, but also the airlines and how these planes are used. So they're really more regional. So a lot of, um, I would say, smaller ish cities or regional flights. So like, like Cincinnati is not a small city by any means, but for United, in terms of demand and interest, that doesn't really warrant. A, let's say the 757, which is like a like a four, you know, like a typical plane they use from Chicago to LA, you know, two massive cities, you know, very, very busy route, or New York. Instead, they use a, more like this, because, okay, we can't fill a plane of 150 passengers, but we can fill a plane of 75 passengers. So that's where you kind of see more of that at play. And especially going you know, these more like, you know, let's say cities like Des Moines, which is a nice little size, they've been huge, or Omaha. That's where these regional airlines really thrive because then it's like, and unfortunately for the people that live there, it's like, well, I need to go to New York. 
Now, with United, obviously there's hubs in these major cities, so sometimes you do get that route. But let's say uh, Los Angeles, um, which is a hub for all the major airlines, they may not have a direct route to Omaha. So that, in that case, you'd be going on the United, United Express flight to Chicago, and then connect to Chicago to uh, Los Angeles. Uh, so that's just, you know, that's an example where you see these type of airlines, but they're very good at connecting these smaller, mid-major markets to, a, to, like a, to like a major, you know, like hub, and then help you connect from there to get wherever they need to go, basically. Or even to like another mid-major. Let's say you need to go from Omaha to Indianapolis. Easy, you can take United Express Chicago, get to Chicago to buy another United Express flight to Indianapolis. So, and they fly a lot a day. Like they don't, you know, like the long hauls will do one route and they're, they're done. They're gonna, you know, those those flights need to rest. But these guys, these guys have been working a good 12 hours a day, hopping between three or four different cities because you know they're only on the ground for like an hour ish, um, if that. And I do think they do switch out crews obviously every so often. Um, you know, which is a good thing and, and legally they have to. But you'll see these planes, you know, if you look at like these routes for like a certain plane number for these, they'll be flying the three, four different scenes in a day. You know, they're hopping all around you know, 90 minutes at a time, two hours at a time, an hour and 20 minutes at a time and vice versa. So anyway, that's kind of like a history of kind of like these planes in particular in terms of how they're being utilized about the, or utilized within the U.S. major airline industry. Um, and one thing before, Let's see, let's take a look at my map. I doubt I can talk the entire time. Yeah, no way. Because <laughs> we're going to jump to St. Louis eventually. But I did want to talk about the issue of Bombardier and how these planes are actually being discontinued. Um, it, it's a little weird too. So I guess I'm trying to think what's the best way to approach it. So, excuse me, I'm going to take a sip of coffee. So Bombardier is a Canadian company. That was found in the bed the mid '80s, um, and you know, well, let me phrase that: the, the aviation side of Bombardier. They do other stuff like um, you know, hard cab, snow coaches. So they make other stuff. But let's just focus on the aviation. Uh, but anyway, so like in the '90s, they kind of started expanding by acquiring these others like Canada Air, Short Brothers, Learjet. Um, then they found a Flex Jet, which they sold in 2013. Uh, but anyway, so they really, you know, really, I'd say in the 90s and 2000s, they really started beginning to become in this regional, like, airline type, um, oh, sorry, like, plane build. You know, we're going to build smaller planes that are very efficient and useful to get around short to mid-haul flights. No long haul, you know, nothing cross country, but help really connect a lot of areas that, you know, they're only like a two hour ish flight away that don't need a 757 or these. Or let's think at the time, you know, the 737 is probably the best version of that. But otherwise, you had a lot of these planes like the McDouglas, the uh, MD 80, MD 90, McDonnell Douglas when they're still around in the air, you know, which seat like well over 100 passengers and you can always fill that out, especially after 9 11. I mean, it, the airline industry crashed around that time. So it made it very um, appealing to start having more of these kind of like smaller aerobotic jets that don't really need 100 passengers but let's say 50 to 75 you know some I think go to 100 that's perfect to connect these like different routes and cities to a major hub and that's basically what you started seeing uh, develop in the last 20 years with a lot of these airlines you know it's all about efficiency you know less you know if you have an air, a plane with empty seats not just a couple let's say half it's empty it's it's losing money no matter what it's not going to make it up so so that's kind of how Bombardier kind of came to be. Um, there are some other ones out there, a couple others I want to say. Like in, I know there's Bombardier. I'm trying to think what's the other one. Is it it's, Bombardier's them? It's the EMB. Yeah, that's a different one I've seen as well. I don't think that's them. I'm checking real quick. Yeah, Embraer. You know, Embraer's a different company. So Embraer's another one, and that was also their first fight was in 2002. Again that same kind of model sphere of like creating these smaller more regional type planes that are, you know are perfect just for 7500 passengers but anyway so back to Bob here so anyway um you know and they basically kind of grew you know they kind of you know create a lot of these commercial aviation throughout the 2000s into the um, 2010s and this is where it starts getting a little weird so one they started having some lawsuit issues 
uh, with Boeing, because Boeing's going to upset how more airlines are well picking these planes for the no real estate 737, especially for like, you know, these regional flights, you know, because that used to be their bread and butter was the 737, and now they're kind of like losing out because now you have these more smartly efficient planes than their 737. And they just end up going down a different route down the road, but that's, uh, you know, that's a different story. Um, but but this kind of all started when uh, Delta Airlines placed order for the aircraft, and then basically Boeing accused my very son, the CS100, uh, below cost to the subsidies from the government. So this is where you had the U.S. government and the U.S. Department of Commerce kind of going after each other uh, with terrorists and stuff because they thought um, either, you know, let me phrase that, because basically the argument was, these comp this plane can be sold at a loss, but it's being covered by the by the Canadian government to basically um, be an uncompetitive, uh, an unfair advantage to Bombay over Boeing, let's say, to, to, to uh, different markets. Uh, but anyway, so that's um, you know, in, in the 18, the U.S. internationally overturned the tariffs. Uh, Boeing did not appeal. I mean, they eventually. Subtle it, but you know it. It got really weird, you know, because then I think the UK had a, a share in this as well. And plus, Canada still recognized the monarchy, so they both were going to agree to stop buying Boeing planes in general. So yeah, it just got really messy between these two. But this is where it gets interesting. So around this time, like around 18, Airbus acquired a 50.1% of the C series, um, and keeping the interest until 2024. Um, and they built the, you know, they helped build the F320. It's not their plane, it's, it's Airbus, but they basically had a facility in Alabama. Um, at the same time, I believe this is also when they started doing the Air A220, I believe. I'll pull that up right in there. Now, the Air 220 is kind of almost like a hybrid between the 320 and this. Uh, big difference. Uh, these are here. Um, it looks at first glance, it looks more like a regular A320. But you realize it's definitely a smaller plane and it sits, fits really well in between kind of merging this plane with let's say the 737, you know, like the like the typical three seats on a three seat side deck plane. Um, but anyway, so Bomb Radio helped design it and they basically Airbus bought like the majority stake in uh, to do it. And and this is where it kind of starts going down a weird path. So, so around 18 at the same time, after this kind of all happened, the company not so the turbo prop passenger got the Viking Air layoffs. Then they sold the business aircraft training business, the CAE. Um, that included the flight simulators and training devices for Bombardier Learjet Challenger and Global Product Lines. I made this offline, by the way. And at 19, June 19, we very agreed with Mitsubishi have initially sell the CRJ program. There you go, there's the big one. So this series of planes um, was just sold to Mitsubishi uh, industrial which is kind of like also the aviation. Uh, they make aviation, but usually helicopters, not much planes to my knowledge, but it might be, that might be changed in the next decade or so. But anyway, so they sold that. That, I know, I don't know if they closed that yet or not, um, but yeah. And then in 19, Barbara, Announced the cigarettes remaining aerostructural division of the U.S. company Spirit Aerosystems. Division of the time, so blah blah blah. New after Bombardier Group and Airbus Group, their aircraft models um, included in October 2020. So, yeah, so basically around 2019, 20, these divisions sell us was their de de decision to get out of commercial uh, aviation. Um, and by commercial, I mean these points, like that going to be sold to United Airlines. Swiss Air, you know, American Eagle. That was their goal to get out of this. Um, they still make private jets, you know, like business type aircraft where you, you know you have like the small jets that can see like 20 people or whatever. Um, and at the same time, in 2020, they acquired another 25% stake in the Airbus 220, and that's basically the end of their commercial. Bombardier's Aviation sole commercial, uh, you know, control of commercial jet industry. Now that that doesn't mean they're in the same so outside the year 20 that outside the a220 a lot of these jets have been now discontinued um, which is kind of weird to think about honestly you know and not just recently I mean this is all kind of just ended this year you know so like you look at what's left uh, they're still gonna make 
you know, they're gonna make these global 7,500, 8,000 planes. They're nice looking, by the way, but they're they're private. They're not commercial aviation. These are like, you know, these are business jets that like a company would buy to use for themselves, basically. Well, like the Airbus 220, you know, that's now completely under the Airbus brand. There's no, even though Bombardier designed it, it's, you know, it's, it's their version now. So it's basically, that's it. You know, it's not, you know, it's, it's gone. It's basically no longer, you know, Airbus, um, the CRJs, you know, that's not part of Mitsubishi. Um, they also, these are out of production now. They just ended production, I think, this, the last year or two. Um, again, I don't know what Mitsubishi is going to eventually do with that. Don't know, honestly. Trying to find that's a little more cloudy. Uh, but yeah, so it'd be, it'd be no, it's not, obviously I mentioned like um, Embraer, so they're, they're not the only small, like mid-range jets in the market for sure, but it's like, it's a major player that has just left the market in the last couple of years, roughly. And again, I don't know why, why they kind of want to go that direction. I think maybe they're losing money, they obviously have these legal issues, you know, um, you know concerns with Boeing in the U.S., you have the U.K. Canadian governments involved. And they honestly, they get subsidies to cover losses, and obviously that makes it uh, very challenging. So, so it just seemed like it's weird. It just seemed like they got they reached a point. You know, they, they're, they're starting to have issues, either poor management or development, whatever it may be. It's like you know what? Let's just get out of here. We're working at Airbus. Let's sell that off. Let's just sell off all these divisions. That's basically what they did. So it's and kind of a shame because honestly, I really like this plan. I've been, they don't mean just because of flying it now. I mean, like, I've flown a lot in this plane for a lot of life. Flights are usually very comfortable, very steady. Like, it's a really well designed plane, in my opinion. And it's just perfect to get around, like, you know, say between, uh, you know, the run Midwest and whatever. So, but that said, that won't be the end of these type of planes. I mean, you got the Embraer um, the 737. I think there is a version of that that's, like, smaller now. It's like weird. So the Max line, this is kind of going off topic into the Boeing line. So the 737 Max has variants. And I think the, the, the smallest one is the Max 7. Um, it, it looks very similar like all the other 737s because it's got the same basic design. However, you know, they're much more efficient, you know, uh, lighter materials. So, you know, it's basically about efficiency, you know, in terms of the cost of flying the plane itself. And, but I think they made the 737 variants where the seven's like the smallest, so that way it's more appealing to, let's say, like, you know, if United wants to phase out United Express and do it themselves, then all right, we'll get a 737 Max 7, which is small and perfect, where it seats like maybe 120, 30 people, you know. Actually, you know, let's pull it up. I got, I got this right here. Yeah, 737, 700, that'd be one of them. So that seats about so 70, yeah. So roughly 115 people, you know, on the 737 Max 7 here. You know, again, I'm just looking at these numbers. Well, like the 900, which is more the longer haul of the 737 series. You know, that seats you know about 170. So yeah, so there's an example right there. See. The variant of the 737 is always on that like 150-ish range, I would say, 140, 150. Now you got variants where you can get that down to about 115, 120, which is pretty pretty suitable for a lot of these routes, some of these routes, especially like St. Louis, Chicago. You know, those planes are usually full. They do like five to eight flights. You know, United, I know, does at least five flights a day between the two. Again, pre-COVID, so now it might be a little more dicey. But, you know, there's definitely a market for that kind of business. And with the 737 Max variants now, they got the longer range, the bigger, longer range plane. So now you have like, hey, you know what? I can take this plane and go three and a half, four hours with no issues. Uh, in fact, that's kind of what Southwest is trying to do with their San Jose hub using the 737 Max 9 to connect um, San Jose with Honolulu. Because they only fly 737s. They don't fly 757s. They don't fly any other version. You know, one kind of plane to keep costs down in terms of maintenance and you know training their people so it makes sense you know how uh, you start seeing these CRJs starting to phase out because now you got 
more stingy competition like from the 737. Or as I said, Airbus with the 320, which is a good version uh, competitive to the 737. But now you have this 220, which is kind of like a hybrid between this CRJ and the 320, where you know it's a um, not as big of a plane as this, or not as big a plane as the 7, you know, like the regular 320, but it's bigger than this. But just small enough that's perfect to you know, really meet the passion and demands and not go too over and too much for a lot of rounds. So and that's kind of kind of where this plane series is at. Now that said, this plane is not going to like disappear anytime soon. Like, you know, most of these planes are only like maybe 10 years old, 15 tops. I mean, you got 777s still in the air. They've been around since like 95. You know, they're 25 years old. Now, planes nowadays can last so much longer. Uh, now, obviously, we can argue if that's a good thing or not. But, like, these planes are probably going to be around for at least another 5, 10 years. So, we really start seeing them phase out. You got the Embraers, as I mentioned earlier, and so forth. So, uh, But, yeah, you know, that's kind of a, a brief history of the Bombardier uh, plane, especially in regards to this series. There's obviously a lot to digest. Um, but, yeah, that kind of just kind of goes over, you know, just kind of like... You know, from my personal experience of flying this, and um, kind of like just what I understand on how they're used for, um, how they're operated, a little bit of their history of this plane and the company, and kind of like where it's going to go in the future. Um, now, kind of back to the review of this plane. In flight sim, you know, as I showed you earlier, um, my only big issue, which again, this might be actually real design, the speed thing is just really weird to me compared to like the, uh, the 320. Um, otherwise, everything else I would need to mess with eventually. But again, those are like details you want to like do it from scratch. So, but anyway, we're gonna turn off AI. And see, it turns really well. Like that's the other thing I can say. This one turns a lot, much easier compared to the 320. That is, which is a little weird because I'm used to doing the 320. Oh, one thing, which is why I kind of did not record until I was out of here. It could take a while to load the uh, CRJ700 up. Like when I did it, first time, it was easy well over 10 minutes. Again, this is a new plane. Um, I'm sure it just depends. However, it saves data in the cache. It took a while. So, but um, I think this won't be too bad here. But just kind of a heads up. So, you know, when you do get it. Um, also, this just didn't go so well. Landmark 4387, clear to lane runway, 1 2 left. Follow the aircraft on final. Wind 1 2 1 and 2 4. Caution the generic landing runway, 1 1. Kind of uh, that said, overall, do I recommend this plane? Um, if you play it a lot like I do, yes. Just doing it once every couple of weeks. Maybe even one, two. It's, it's a nice new addition. Uh, for me, I like it. I want to learn more, especially because I'm trying to get better control on it. It's very different from the 3.1. You see, it turns, as I said, very easily. You know, it's, it's definitely, it's almost more versatile no, I, I don't know if easy control is the right word, because I am going to keep mine a little harder. Oh. oh, hold on. Now you see, it's doing the speed and it's locking up on me, so I gotta do this. Um, I hope this would be an update soon, because <laughs> this is honestly really hard enough. We see a southwest plane up to take on. But you see, it, it, it rises and falls really fast, which is kind of why I've really been struggling with it. United 19 or 4 flight contact ground on 127 decibel 55. Yeah, 
kind of give you a Oh, there it is. United one nine or four five acknowledge last transmission. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Going to one two seven decimal five five United one nine or four five. Oh, I'm really struggling here. <laughs> this would actually break the points here. <laughs> oh well, let's uh, here I'm gonna be really picky. Let's see if it takes me to the right gate, just because I only know this. Way. Ground United one nine or four five request taxi to the gate. Do you see it look again? This is my United speed one moves up really fast. Taxi, don't have as much control. Way, uh, compared to let's say the, the, uh, the airplane one. Again, this just came out. I'm sure there probably will be updates that probably change this and make it a little more uh, easier. Um, that's my guess. You know, again, I know I'm not a world fly, so I've never been in a yeah, I've never flown an actual CRT. United 49 acknowledge last transmission. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Taxi to gate Alpha 8 so by a taxi will, way Charlie United 19045. This may be how the role plane operates. Which, uh, I'm sure people that fight a like it used to it and know how to control it, but someone that's like me, <laughs> uh, it's, been a, it's been a learning curve, that's for sure, early on. Oh, good. So they're actually taking me to the right gate. These are the United Gates right here, actually, at Lambert Airport. I'm still waiting for them to add this. Someone add this airport. I like to see it. So, but yeah, this is basically um, overall a little review and history of this plane. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, as I said, if you if you're flying a lot in this game, and especially like the commercial aviation side, like I do, you know, not just find it interesting, but really enjoying kind of doing these type of routes, and almost kind of recreating the realism of flying. United one nine four five call position caution other traffic. Highly recommend it. Remember later waiting for that. Whatever. United one nine four five continue taxi. Yeah, it was. Huh. Roger United one nine or four five. United one nine or four five call position caution huh? other traffic. How about no? United one nine or four five continue taxi. There you go. We actually pulled in pretty well. Landing could have been a lot better. Roger United, one oh, I gotta show you five. this. I will show you this part. Right. Uh, Ground link, Burke 4387, request taxi to the gate. Link, Burke 4387, taxi. Alright, I have a big issue. When they keep talking, it somehow resets. It's like, I'm always at number 5, I think. You know, the jet. I want the jet. There we go. Ground United, one nine or four five. could you please connect the jetway to the aircraft? United 1-9-4-5, the jetway is going to be connected. And it does connect in real life, too. It's kind of cool. As you watch these, these can actually go up and down. So you know, it's got like a crawler. So that's why you see... Yeah, you know, that's what makes it really cool. Because you see other times, it's pretty high for these bigger planes. But smaller ones like this. And the one thing it doesn't seem to do well... See, it is a new plane, I get it. This, this can still lower on top of it. But yeah, anyway, there you go. So that's kind of a brief overview of the CRJ. Oh, planes. The other one, they both fly very similar. They both got the same stats. So anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, thanks for watching.